Welcome to this conversation that we're having today with Matt Prashan, the Chief Marketing and Demand Generation Officer for NTT. I am Vijay Ramachandran, and for many, many, many years, I've been focused on telling the story on how do organizations and individuals make the leap? How do they transform? How do they change? So I'm really interested in talking to Matt today to find out what's really changing, not just with NTT, but also the way that he and his team are approaching clients. What are they doing? How are they collaborating with colleagues within Entity? And things like that. Now, the reason why we're having this conversation is Matt's responsible for leading Entity's marketing and demand generation function, encompassing both digital and account-based marketing. Now, he's been a veteran of the industry prior to joining Entity. He's been with Forcepoint, CA Technologies, HCL Technologies, and even IBM. Uh, Matt's been named amongst the top 20 most influential CMOs by Forbes, and he's been recognized for his success in driving marketing innovation by the CMO Club. Now, I gave you some of the lay of the land uh, that we're going to go over with Matt, and I really wanted to start with his designation. So, Matt, welcome to this podcast. Uh, given that you're both the Chief Marketing and Demand Generation Officer at Entity, how are you really seeing customer outreach evolve? First of all, well, Jay, thank you very thank you. much um, for uh, the conversation today. I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing some of my thoughts with you and, and the audience. Um, so I, I find it actually interesting in the spirit of your question that um, you use the word outreach. And the way I would probably you know, rephrase that is I actually think it's about the interaction. So in more traditional models, you would think that that, you know, the marketing department in quotes controls the message, communicates the message and pushes the message and the positioning to prospects, customers and the marketplace. I think what we, uh, what most of us in our personal lives, but have experienced and continue to experience, and I don't think it's any different in the B2B space, is that as a prospect or a customer, you will choose to interact with a given brand on your own terms when you choose to, and you most likely are going to do that through various different, you know, digital vehicles. You may go to a search engine, and type in a subject matter that's of interest. And when you do so, you're going to get your top five companies. Then you probably click on that. You're going to end up at a website. When you end up on that website, you're going to start searching for things that are of interest. And, you know, we'll get more into the detail of that. But the, the key premise of all of that, and I think, unfortunately, most of us, uh, experience that even more so during COVID is that the entire front end of the traditional sales process has been disintermediated, right? And that puts marketing, if it's done right, and if it's done in a very cohesive manner, actually in a really important role. Because customers will interact with your brand and with the content that you serve if you can be found and if it's relevant. And if I'm a B2B customer, I'd probably like to know, are there other customers who've done this before? Have analysts endorsed me? Are there any thought leadership or white papers that can actually substantiate what it is? Or are the capabilities and offerings easy to consume? Could I download an ROI calculator? Things of that nature. And in that context, by the way, if you believe what I just said, that the front end of the sales process has been disintermediated, that gives you also a sense maybe to the title. It's marketing and demand generation, and demand generation is in conjunction with sales and we'll get into ABM and other types of, of mechanisms in a, in a minute. Okay. Uh, thanks for you know, giving that overview uh, of what's really been uh, changing, especially 
post COVID because that's really been a watershed. Things have never been the same after that. Now, when I look at P2P organizations uh, and their approach towards customers, there is a, some of them take a very hardcore sales approach. Some of them take a more marketing based approach. Is there a distinct demand approach as well? So, I, I, look, I, 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 this question I absolutely love because I think it is, um, it is, it actually reflects a little bit the maybe dissonance in the marketplace. My, my personal view is I always take an approach from a customer lens. And if I'm a customer, frankly speaking, I don't particularly care whether I'm interacting with a marketing department or with a sales department or whether I'm interacting. I'm interacting with a company that I'd like to do business with. And in that context, the more seamless that interaction is, and the more specific content and the information that I need to internally convince my own stakeholders, uh, if I can get access to that, whether that is in a digital space on my own time or now as we're coming out of COVID, increasingly also again in in-person meetings, I think that is what customers value the most. So in my personal view, the most cohesive and best demand generation approaches are shared between marketing and sales. They are not marketing or sales, right? It is an integrated approach that ought to be seamless. And if we as companies, as functions can, can create that environment, then I believe the customer experience that will go, you know, keep in mind in the B2B space, I think all the research indicates that from the beginning of the sales cycle to the end of the sales cycle, there are probably somewhere between 15 to 20 interactions. 15 to 20, it's not like one and done, right? We're selling high value, usually longer sales cycle type of solutions, particularly in the IT space. So when you interact, you're gonna interact in a digital space. You're gonna have a personal meeting. You may attend a conference. You're gonna download a white paper. You're going to maybe call an analyst because you saw uh, 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 you know, all kinds of different things. Again, the demand generation component is marketing sales working together in a trusted environment with a maniacal focus on the customer related issues at hand. And that's how I personally in the past and continue to approach my role. Right. Now, you talked about this marketing and sales collaboration uh, being seamless in the way in which you interact with clients. Has this changed entity as an organization, the way you're structured, the way you approach customers, as well as how you actually end up partnering with custom customers through that entire life cycle? Because like you said, in B2B sales, particularly technology sales, it's not a short life cycle. You mentioned 15 to 20 interactions. It takes time. It may take a few weeks, a few months sometimes, depending on how complex the solution set is. Uh, so what has really changed within Entity uh, so, towards this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, great question. Um, so a couple of things on this, right? I mentioned the things that, you know, I believe marketing in quote owns that we're responsible for. And I would like to suggest that we've made significant progress. We have on the one hand, we've redesigned our entire web presence, have consolidated, you know, 12 different websites into one. We've, we've, we have a maniacal focus now on, on customer success stories. We have built up our analyst relations uh, efforts. We've repositioned the strategic growth place for the company. So we've done a lot on our side. On the sales side, we've put enormous rigor in place on account plans, sales methodologies. How do we actually do value selling, not just product feature selling? And those are, in my view, the type of functional responsibilities that the leaders in those respective areas have to do. But in the spirit of my earlier comment of joint demand generation. So look, I, I am of the opinion that because of the power of technology, we are going to see an, uh, the next degree of personalization that maybe people in the B2C space have been accustomed to for a long time. 
And you know, one of the 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 areas that we have in quotes doubled down is on ABM. And many of you may know ABM as account based marketing. I personally prefer account based management because I don't believe that any account related activities are just one functions of you know a marketing's responsibility. And so what what have we done? And what we're continuous continuously uh, doing in that space. We now pretty much at the beginning of every quarter, uh, in conjunction with the country or the regions, we actually uh, agree upon what we would call the must win, the must win battle, so to speak. And we then between the account plan of the sellers and our ability to provide account specific information uh, that can be who are the buyers, who has actually budgetary sign off responsibilities. What's the, you know, we deployed a, 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 a great tool, Terminus, that allows you to actually do digital intent monitoring. So you know if you have the right contacts, what type of buying behavior happens in the digital space. And when you combine that, you actually, I think, are equipping your sellers with a level of insight, knowledge, expertise that changes the quality of the dialogue that you would expect in today's world, right? The days of cold selling or we just go in there and you sell feature functions are long gone. And and I do believe we're still, you know, we're still we still have things to learn and, and get better and, and, and run this globally. But I feel very strongly that we have uh, we already have some fantastic success stories, by the way, right? In in both in Europe. In the US, we have seen a few uh, examples here in, in Asia Pacific, including India as well. But that is one very specific example where I do believe we're changing the way B2B marketing and selling moves towards integrated demand generation. Now you mentioned Terminus, this tool that gives you insight, it is able to track uh, individuals within organizations that that you're partnering with your clients uh, maybe gives you a sense of their budgets their buying cycles and things like that uh, i'm just curious how much of this b2b buying process can be digitized can be automated uh, and is it possible to really assign a hard roi to this so so i <laughs> i love the question so first for everyone i am a I geek personally, I geek out on numbers and I love technology and digital and all of that. But one of my convictions is, has been and will not change. People do people, people do business with people who they trust and know. Let me say that one more time, just for effect, if you allow me. People do business with people who they trust and know. So now, do we have technology today to change the sales process, the marketing process? Does that allow us to have more information and be better informed? Yes, but now as we're coming out of COVID, look, the, the, the quintessential looking someone straight in the eye, having a handshake, and ha actually having the trusted relationship that is required above and beyond a one-time transaction, that will never change. So in that context, digital technology is the differentiated enabler, in my view, to create a better interaction with your prospects and customers, but it will never replace certain aspects of a relationship and in the B2B space, particularly in technology, right? It's not a transaction of, you know, I'm buying a piece of gum or I'm buying a, a, a product that's being consumed in a day or two. These are usually longer term 
year long relationships that require, you know, working through issues and so forth. So now your second question was on the RI. Look, this is obviously in the marketing community, a usually heated debate. Is it, what's the attribution? Is it first touch attribution, last touch attribution, multi-touch attribution? At the end of the day, let's, let's, I always do this. Let's go right back to the customer. The customer is going to interact with our company. They're going to interact with us 15 to 20 times. There are enough technology tools that can actually illustrate to you what type of interactions that happen. You will find that usually probably two thirds of those interactions are facilitated in some form or fashion through a marketing department if they have built the right digital background, right? But that one third that eventually and now again that happens face to face between the sellers, that's not going to go away and it should not go away. That's the human interaction that's important. So now, do we all have to demonstrate that we're adding value to our respective companies? Of course we do. But I do not believe that that happens through an attribution discussion. If you engage with your sales teams early enough in the process and you agree through the account plan and the ABM methodologies, account-based management, not marketing methodologies, then this attribution question at the end is going to be much less of a, 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 you know, a question. If you choose not to and you run in, in, in parallel silos and at some point you need to prove that you did something, yes, you're going to have an attribution discussion that usually, honestly, in, in any company, I don't find to be highly valuable. It's just an emotional back and forth that's, that, frankly speaking, I don't find to be too valuable. Right. Now, uh, Matt, you've talked about how this collaborative approach uh, has changed entity as an organization, how you're partnering with clients to ensure their success. Now, the other change that's coming your way is this impending integration with entity data. Uh, what are you planning to do or are you already doing to you know, extract the maximum value out of this merger and the value that finally customers can derive out of that. It's interesting because I'm going to, I'm going to, and forgive me for doing so, you know, your last words were finally customers. I'm going to start again right there. Let's start with the customers and the value they will derive. So for those of you who, who have been in technology, we always talk about the technology stack, right? The infrastructure portion, then it goes in the application space and it goes upstream, right? In NTT, we also have a fantastic networking business, one of the you know largest networking providers in the world. So the premise of bringing those two companies together is to have a truly integrated value proposition. Because in today's world, frankly speaking, you're not going to have an infrastructure conversation or a cloud conversation that not at some point gets into a data conversation. And frankly speaking, even if many conversations today may be in industry verticals that start with data, look, I've worked for IBM a long time ago and I've been told many, many years ago that the mainframe is dead. Uh, hasn't played out that way, ladies and gentlemen, right? If anything, you actually need more compute power today than you ever needed in the world, and it's actually continuously growing. So I'm of the I'm of the firm belief that from a customer perspective in the integrated value proposition that entity limited and entity data will pull together will be beneficial to our prospects and customers. Now, what does this what do we have to do? First and foremost, like most technology companies, that may be somewhere around $20 billion. I think it will, as a first step, we have to truly prioritize our capabilities and offerings. We cannot be everything to everybody across the entire IT stack. That is work that will go, that will, you know, come underway in, in, in short part. But then, frankly speaking, the rest is on us internally. Right. I've always said, look, the, and again, I go back to my earlier example. Um, 
customers are not particularly going to care uh, about the integration challenges that we may be facing. What they're going to care about is today you give me an entity limited contract and entity data contract. Tomorrow can I have one integrated contract? And by the way, instead of being a 70 page contract, can it be 10 pages long? Just as one illustrative. OK, today we may have an entity data website and entity limited website. OK, tomorrow we need to have one website. Today we may be talking about, you know, we may have um, analyst interactions on certain capabilities of entity data on Monday, and then on Wednesday we have interactions with the same analyst on entity limited. Let's have one conversation. Just to give you, you know, and I think in, in, in the transformations I've been part of, look, the customers and prospects, they understand when companies come together that sometimes there is some, you know, challenges that are associated. But I, for one, given the leadership position I've been entrusted upon, um, I'd like to focus on the things I just mentioned, and we will do our very best as a company to position ourselves and serve our customers in the spirit of the value that we want to create for them. And then the internal things we have to do. And in that context, however, let me not minimize that. It's very important. The biggest asset of a company are still our people. So the employee value proposition, the type of employer that we are, who we, what we care about. We have a, a very strong belief in sustainability. We have a diversity and inclusion agenda that is very important to us. We'd like to think we provide career opportunities that go above and beyond. That part is the other side that you may not necessarily think of as a marketeer, but per my previous experience, I have always, for all of, of you uh, here in India, I've always loved the employer brand focus that many companies here articulate even stronger than you would find in other parts of the world. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, I think what I really liked was right from the get go, right to the end. Uh, the approach that you take putting customers front and center, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, you talk of it as an interaction. You talk of it as a collaborative approach. You talk about it as being something that's focused not just on what entity gets out of it, which we all understand, but what's in it for the customer and the fact that they have choices out there. So how are you working with them to make sure that their success, their business value, what they're able to derive out of it? Because, you know, price is what a customer pays, but value is what they really derive. And I think that's where relationships and that interaction and that relationship really uh, come to bear. Uh, so thank you so much, Matt, for taking the time out. I know your schedule's busy, so thank you so much for taking the time out uh, and giving us some sense of what's not only been changing, but what continues to change within entity. But what does not change is your focus on customers. Thanks so much. Great, BJ and everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I hope that, you know, if we have a chance to interact again a year, year and a half down the road, that all the things I mentioned today will have manifested themselves within our customer base and that you will hopefully look at, at NTT as a, a great technology provider, a fantastic employer that's socially responsible and tries to do the right thing in that context for customers, society, and the planet at large. So thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, we've been in conversation with Matt Prashan, the Chief Marketing and Demand Generation Officer at NTT. This is Vijay Ramachandran uh, signing off. I hope you, you also derived a lot of value from learning about what's changing, not just with NTT, but with the way that B2B marketing and sales the entire life cycle, the interaction with customers, where the value really lies in all of that. Thank you so much for your patience in listening to this. Take care, stay safe, and stay positive.